collaborations. I think he's uh, uh, a rising star and proving to be one of the world's uh, experts on the topic today. Romero? Well, thank you. Um, we're going to talk about something that's probably a little bit different than usual at these uh, webinars. Uh, and we're going to bring in uh, myself, a veterinarian, uh, to provide a slightly different perspective. So I look forward to some good discussions and uh, hopefully some um, new thoughts will arise from, from this uh, discussion. So I will be the primary presenter. My background is uh, as a veterinarian. Uh, Dr. Fennelly will be the moderator, as you've just seen, uh, and he'll also pa uh, add some background as a physician. Uh, so between the two of them, uh, two of us, I hope that um, we cover this topic. So what I want to try to cover in this is first to get a basic understanding of elephant TB as an elephant disease. Um, most people at the seminar are, are probably used to thinking of TB as a primary human disease, which it is, uh, but we're going to kind of go on the fringes a little bit and try to understand it as a zoonotic uh, or animal disease, in this case specifically an elephant. So a uh, very brief introduction to the biology of elephants for those of you who don't have elephant patients on a daily basis. I uh, want to discuss prevalence uh, of TB in the captive elephants, uh, give you an idea or a taste of the diagnostic challenges that elephants present uh, that are very different than what a human patient might present to you, and then touch a little bit on the issues around treat treatment of elephants for TB. Um, so that's a general background that I want you to get. Um, the second concept is to change from having TB as a primary human disease, which it is, um, to again a zoonotic or also animal disease, which it is in a small part. And the reason I think this is relevant and interesting to a lot of people, it touches on a new subject that everybody's talking about, is the One Health. Uh, One Health Initiative, and that is combining uh, medicine to span both human medicine and veterinary medicine. And I think this is a real-life situation, uh, a, a real example of that concept that a lot of people are talking about. Uh, then we're going to move on to how to really deal with this, kind of this is the practical part of what I want to talk about, uh, and how you might actually um, use this information and practice. And to do that, we're going to talk about two um, scenarios. Uh, uh, one is, you know, a hypothetical situation of what you would do if somebody wanted to bring uh, some elephants to a local zoo uh, and there was some issues of elephant uh, TB surrounding those animals. And as a public health uh, person, you, you might have to answer some questions. So this hopefully will give you some background to be able to answer those types of uh, general information media questions. And then also I wanted to have another scenario of, of, of an elephant worker, hypothetical elephant worker, uh, that is presenting for evaluation um, as a routine patient and what you might say uh, to that patient um, relative to the information from this webinar. So to set the conversational mood, uh, I'd like to start out with a couple of questions. Um, this isn't like school. There's no grades. There's no – a lot of these uh, question sets actually don't have – absolute correct answers. Uh, by the format, you need to select one, uh, but they're more set up for, A, having me figure out if I'm getting my point across to everybody, uh, but also to, to start setting up some discussions and maybe some questions that you'd like to send out to us. So let's start out with a simple one. Um, do you know or do you consider that elephants can be infected with tuberculosis? Um, is, is, this a new, is this a new subject to you? So I see a few people saying yes. Go ahead and click away at the buttons. And we're getting some more. I'm happy to say that some people are being very honest and saying they have no idea. That's why they're here at the seminar. <laughs> okay, so it, it looks like the majority, great majority of you um, say yes, and obviously if you signed up for this webinar, you, you would have some idea of it. Uh, I'm glad to have people that, that uh, click the last two, which is uh, maybe and no idea, uh, because maybe this uh, educational webinar will uh, help you resolve that uh, one way or the other. 
The next question is a practical question I, I had. Is, is this a real problem that any of you are seeing in your practice? Uh, have you ever dealt with this type of question, or is this totally, uh, completely novel to your practice? And that may be public health practice, uh, or the clinical practice, or, or those of us that are veterinarians, uh, veterinarian practice. And as the votes are coming in, it, it seems that uh, this is um, primarily, you haven't seen it, but by being at this webinar, I guess you're anticipating in the future you might have to see a case or at least have a, a background knowledge of this. So, um, and 5% so far um, have seen it several times, so at least a few of you are seeing this on a regular basis. So that's interesting. Okay, so moving on. Uh, I'm setting up the idea that we'll talk about more in detail that uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, the human disease, is occasionally a zoonotic disease. And I want to take the focus off ele elephants for a minute. How many of you uh, are aware if any of these species can be infected with MTB? Uh, that is from the literature. And which species do you think primarily are the ones? And I'm seeing an early uh, lead on primates, and that's good because primates have been classically um, associated with MTB uh, as lab animals. Uh, they're both a laboratory model, so they can be purposely infected with this organism, but also from a lab animal management perspective, uh, uh, they're susceptible to human TB and can have uh, TB run through a collection of primates. So that's the most in the literature, the species has been described the most. Uh, very few of you said dogs and cats, and that's actually correct, although there are case reports of MTB, uh, basically the pets of people, humans with TB, that the dog, and, and then even rare, the cat, uh, and in actually a couple cases of ferrets have been infected. Similar with birds, and actually what I'm thinking about here is parrots. There's uh, been a handful of cases of uh, MTB in parrots. And the, um, the idea I have in my mind is of the pirate with a parrot on his shoulder. And, of course, the pirate has TB, uh, and it gives the TB to the parrot. But even that is, is a fairly rare occurrence. So all of the above is actually a correct answer, um, along with all the other ones individually. What I'd like to say here, though, is, is that all of those are very rare case reports, and even primates, uh, it it's not ever found in the wild that I know of. MTB is not a disease of wild animals that maintains itself in a population of wild animals, uh, even primates. Primates, when they have MTB, often are always associated with humans. Uh, and the elephants we're going to talk about here are slightly different in that uh, MTB seems to be common in them, not wild, as we'll talk about earlier, but common in captive animals, uh, captive elephants. So, Ramiro, can I just add something here? Um, I'd like to play, pay homage to the lowly guinea pig, uh, which has, has contracted TB from many humans in experimental studies. So the guinea pig is really responsible for us understanding that TB is an airborne disease. Um, you ruined my, uh, <laughs> my future question, which I was going to ask. That's okay. Uh, yes, guinea pigs and a handful of other lab animals um, can be given MTB experimentally, but guinea pigs are unique in that they can seem to pick it up out of the environment, and everybody knows back in the 50s or so uh, of this classic uh, exam uh, experiments where they put guinea pigs in the airflow uh, of tuberculosis wards to prove that it could be spread by aerosol. Uh, so yes, guinea pigs are a, a, a good lab animal model for naturally picking up this disease. All right, moving on. So here's a kind of an overall idea. Uh, MTB in, in this country, uh, many of us are dealing with it professionally, but I just wanted an opinion uh, question as to do you consider this as the recipients of this webinar, uh, that this is an important disease? So I'm seeing some, uh, some votes coming in, and it's looking like a classic bell curve right now. Uh, Senator Duran undecided, and good, that's what this, this webinar is about. At the end of this webinar, I'll repeat a similar question, and, and hopefully 
the opinions will change, but I'm not going to say which direction because it depends a little bit on your perspective, and this is part of the learning process. I, I just want to hopefully provide enough information that uh, your opinion will change in some meaningful way. Finally, um, I'm trying to introduce the concept of people who working with, that work with elephants may actually be a new uh, or unrecognized uh, risk group for uh, getting TB in the United States. Um, and so to do that, uh, uh, the classic place we think of TB, uh, occupational TB, is health-related work, physicians, nurses, and such working um, with patients. Uh, but I wanted to ask the, the group, how many people have heard of non-health-related TB as an important issue, as an occupational risk, and which ones of these are, uh, would you choose? So majority of is all of the above, and it's true. Uh, these are classically associated non-health-related uh, uh, places where you can uh, potentially be exposed to TB. Uh, answer C, or the yellow one, uh, is the one I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, today because we're going to be talking about a group of people who make their living working with elephants. And as we're going to discuss, elephants do have MTV, and so is it an occupational risk, and what, uh, what precautions can we or should we take for that risk group? Okay, so that kind of gives me some groundwork of where everybody's coming from and what the base knowledge is. I was when I first asked to do this uh, presentation, I, I was asked to to make sure I included a case report, uh, and so I I was a veterinarian, have to put in an animal case report first. Uh, so I'm going to present a case of an elephant uh, that is um, a hypothetical, but based on a, a conglomerate of cases I've seen uh, to represent one case report. Uh, the, the elephants uh, that, that I've seen um, all are going to be Asian elephants. Uh, this particular one is male, about 14 years old, captive born. Uh, if you put it in human terms, would be classified in an adolescent age at 14 years of age. Uh, and having typical husbandry uh, expected of an elephant. So everything is going perfectly normal for this animal. Uh, he was born in captivity, as I mentioned. This is actually his picture, but just a very cute picture of a ba baby elephant uh, uh, under the mom. Uh, but everything went perfect with this animal in terms of it was healthy, gaining weight, uh, absolutely no problems noted. And on routine physical examination, as we took care of it as it was growing up, um, never any clinical signs, uh, perfectly normal examination. Uh, and so everything was going fine uh, until one day on a routine uh, trunk wash, we'll talk about what that is, but it's a screening for TB, this animal surprisingly came up positive for tuberculosis. So here, a perfectly healthy young animal has spread it, uh, is, has culture positive uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And this is typical case presentation that I see uh, from elephants. So some background on elephants and elephant um, TB. Let's start out with some, just some basic animal uh, background. Elephants come from uh, uh, elephants come in uh, two uh, or three species. I say that because Asian elephants are the ones we're going to talk about today uh, are from the Asian subcontinent, <coughs> and then there's African elephants. And recently, they've subdivided the African elephants into two species. We're going to focus on Asian elephants. Uh, a little trivia for those people who like animal trivia: you can tell the male from the female here because. Only the male has tusks in this species, whereas African elephants, if you think about it, um, the female also has tusks. So if I see a tusked Asian elephant, I know it's a male. Uh, so that's uh, – and then there's – I love to give students a whole bunch of other list of differences between, between the species. But for now, I just wanted to focus our attention on Asian elephants. So Asian elephants, um, unfortunately, are not doing very well in the world. Um, this little map of the Asian subcontinent, uh, you see India in the center of it uh, for geographical reference. And all that in yellow is where these elephants used to be common. Uh, they used to be their range. Uh, so that yellow area is not where they are now. The only places they're living is in those little black spots. 
And the, their range is contracting, their numbers are contracting. They're actually doing much worse as a population than the African elephant. So there's some significant uh, conservation issues around both species of elephants, but particularly Asian elephants. And again, they're CITES-1 animals, which means they're, they're, they are endangered officially and highly regulated. Uh, reasons for this, uh, there are lots, and it's a complex uh, story. Uh, to, to oversimplify it, there is not a whole lot of pristine range area for these animals. The idea of, of the, the, the deep forest uh, and, and areas where they're not in conflict with humans. Uh, as you see in an idyllic picture in the left, the left picture, and the right picture is an aerial view of, of, of unfortunately, a, a, a reality, which is a lot of their habitat is being turned into agricultural areas or inhabited by humans. So there's a definite, um, as an oversimplification, uh, encroachment of, of humans and, and competition with humans is one of the major reasons for their decrease in population. So total numbers of Asian elephants in the wild is estimated to be 30,000. If you think about it, 30,000 is a very small city in the United States. Uh, and that's all the Asian elephants in the wild. So there's not a lot of them. To contrast that, there are approximately 500,000 African elephants in Africa. So there's a big difference in the total numbers. On top of those 30,000 they estimate being in the wild, they estimate that there's an additional 10,000 in Asia living in captive or semi-captive situations. These are animals that um, are owned uh, or possessed by humans uh, that um, are, are, are and live closely in close association with humans as, as domestic or semi-domesticated animals. This picture is a picture I took from Sri Lanka. Uh, and it highlights a, a couple things for me. Is, is one is that there's a very close human-elephant um, relationship with, with these animals over there. Uh, where family groups live around these animals in a very close proximity. This elephant's getting a bath right now, uh, and the father or the mate, uh, is uh, in the forefront of the picture, and then the younger generation is helping in the back. Um, the other thing is to uh, point out that um, some of these people um, have these animals as the primary family investment. So they use these animals for, and classically for logging industry, uh, but they also um, will use them now for the tourist industry and, and other purposes. So, but this is their, their, oftentimes their family livelihood, and they often have a relationship with one animal or two animals for a long period of time. Switching to the United States, um, the uh, population in the United States is roughly 280. Uh, it can roughly be uh, subdivided into uh, three groups. The uh, accredited zoos, about one third, uh, traveling circuses, the second third, and then what I term private um, ownership of elephants is another third. So I uh, roughly can split this group into, into thirds, um, and there's about 280 total. Well, uh, down here at the Southeastern National Tuberculosis Center, when you wonder why we have an elephant uh, person working at the vet school across the street. Re one of the primary reasons I came here is with a 100-mile radius of Gainesville, I can find about 100 elephants, uh, both Asian and African, and primarily Asian. So as a research subject, I, I find it very convenient. Uh, and the reason I put this also up is, is be surprised uh, in other places of the United States um, how how common elephants can be in terms of you can find them in your neighborhood uh, in your regional area if you look. So they're out there. Those 300 are spread out uh, throughout the United States. So this slide is, is to uh, have me talk ab about you know, why these animals are important. Um, obviously, we've talked about endangered species. So every animal, when you've got a population of 30,000, uh, particularly of a long-lived species that doesn't reproduce very quickly, uh, every animal is important, be it male or female, uh, young or old. Um, and so they have intrinsic value from a conservation uh, perspective. Uh, they also have a, a less well-defined charismatic value. Uh, elephants um, are near and dear to a lot of people's heart. And, when, and they're also oftentimes the central animal at a zoo. 
obviously at a circus, they're often a central animal. So th there's a lot of charismatic um, concerns surrounding um, these elephants. And then finally, there is actually monetary uh, investment. I, I mentioned that for the mahouts, that these animals can be a, a, a central family asset. Uh, in the United States, um, estimated value of an elephant is about $500,000. Um, and a baby elephant, particularly a female baby elephant, can be valued much more than that. Uh, so they're not, they, they do have actual monetary investment. But the real reason I bring this up is not the monetary issue. It, it's, it begs the question, you know, why do we treat elephants any different than cows? And the model for tuberculosis, M tuberculosis control and cattle is testing cull. Uh, and you never talk about treatment. Uh, elephants are different. From the beginning, we, we as, as a collective group, uh, established their value and said, no, these animals, we have to look at more on a human model and think about diagnosing TB and possibly treating TB versus the older model of just testing TOL. So I put that up there just to answer that question that anybody have out there. So, Romero, um, we don't use the word cull in human medicine much. You want to... Cull, um, cull is, uh, is a ruthless form of medicine uh, that it sometimes uh, historically has been uh, used in veterinary medicine. Uh, where you test a, a group of animals for whatever, spe uh, whatever disease you're looking for, and if they're positive, you remove them, kill them from the population. Um, it's a ruthless method, um, but effective. It actually brought down the incidence of M. bovis in the United States uh, from being very high in the early part of the previous century, uh, and through a test and cull approach um, has brought it down to where we are currently, which is very rare disease in the cattle industry. Um, so that's what we mean by it. Obviously, that approach is not appropriate for human medicine, and that's actually the point I'm trying to make. It's not appropriate for elephants, or at least in the discussions I've, I've been involved with, not, we're not going that direction. Yeah, thank you. So um, moving on a little bit. Um, a little basic background. A lot of you probably are well aware of uh, the mycobacteria, so this is be a little bit basic, but there's a point I want to make in here. Mycobacteria can be subdivided into three rough groups uh, with uh, other tuberculosis or atypicals making up the, the largest one, about 80 species of uh, microorganisms in this other mycobacteria group. Most of them are, are uh, environmental. Uh, most of them are, are not pathogenic, or at least not routinely. Uh, a few of them, though, do cause disease, and I kind of put them as examples in, in the white boxes. The one I want to talk about briefly is M. marinum, and M. marinum is actually a fish pathogen. Fish can get a, a granulomatous uh, ulceration that can get sick and die from it, so in a sense it's tuberculosis of fish. Uh, but I bring it up for this discussion because... It's a primary fish pathogen that is definitely zoonotic to humans. Humans get fish finger for handling and being pricked by the fins of these infected fish. Uh, so it's a classic animal-to-human zoonosis. Moving over to M avium complex, uh, M avium, as the name implies, is primarily associated with poultry or birds. Um, and uh, it's a classic disease of birds. Uh, birds do get sick from it. Uh, and again, it's can go to humans, so it can be a classic animal-to-human zoonotic disease. Moving on to MTB complex, uh, it's, it's a group uh, of organisms that are subdivided because they're related to MTB. The one as a veterinarian I'm most familiar with is M. bovis, as I mentioned, uh, it has been an important pathogen in cattle. Uh, and there's related M to M. bovis, several uh, uh, other species like a goat M. bovis. Uh, BCG vaccine comes from M. bovis, or at least that's one of the theories. Uh, from my perspective as a zoo vet, there is a seal M. bovis, uh, uh, which has actually has its own species name now. Moving to the more human ones, uh, the important point, uh, important point about M. bovis is that humans can get M. bovis from animals. Again, a classic cattle pathogen going to humans. And I keep stressing that because when you go to MTV, it is a human disease. And I want to stress that it's a human disease. 
that gets transmitted, um, as all of you know, from humans to humans pretty pretty well overall. It's pretty successful as a pathogen in humans. Uh, and it's rarely thought of as a, a zoonotic disease, but, and when you do think about it as a zoonotic disease, you actually need to think of it as a reverse zoonotic disease, primarily in humans, but now going to animals. And I think that's an important point uh, as we go on with the discussion. So to stress the importance of, uh, of those is when we're talking about MTB in Asian elephants, we're not talking about M. bogus. That was an early mistake a lot of people made. We're not talking about atypicals. Uh, and we're definitely talking about MTB as a primary pathogen. So, yeah, Romero, let me ask a question. Uh, not all of our listeners or viewers may be familiar with the term reverse zoonotic or zoonosis. Can you define that for us? Yeah, it, it's a... It's a new kind of idea because we're always trained to think of zoonosis as animals have disease, like a, like a turtle has salmonella, salmonella, and a child is exposed to that turtle and gets sick. That's the classic direction of, of zoonotic disease. But it's occurred to a lot of people recently um, that there are situations like we're going to talk about today where the pathogen can originate from a human and go to the animal. And the definition of zoonosis in general is, is, a, is a disease that's shared between animals and humans. So reverse zoonosis is a way of saying it's going from the people to the animals. And one of the uh, – somebody just had a question about what about transmission of M. bovis from humans to cattle? Transmission of M. bovis from humans to cattle? I, I'm, I'm not sure that's actually been in the literature because – Again, it's, it's, uh, our paradigm is that M. bovis is a cattle disease. Humans can get M. bovis. There's been zoonotic cases of M. bovis in humans. Uh, but I have not seen case reports of a human giving a, a cattle uh, or cow M. bovis. Theoretically, it's possible. I just have not seen a case report of it. Great, thanks. And by the way, if any of uh, the listeners uh, out there have references about cases like this that we're not aware of, uh, please send them in and we'll uh, disseminate them. Uh, Certainly. This is a, a fluid discussion. I'm, whenever you say something doesn't happen, somebody's always going to be able to Google <laughs> a new uh, a, a reference to contradict that. Um, but the point is, um, I think that classically, Envobus has gone to people. That, that's been well described. But the, the, the form of this question, I, I haven't I haven't been aware of it as a, a human disease going back to the cattle. Okay, so we're going to switch now to kind of a little history lesson uh, about elephants and TB. Um, as we're going to point out in a minute, it's, it's become a topic of interest, but you have to look back on it historically. As several papers have mentioned, uh, TB in elephants has actually probably been recognized at some form or another in elephants for 2,000 years. And certainly in the Western literature here, you know, states in Europe, uh, from the beginning of last century um, through the end of this previous century, uh, people knew elephants got TB, and it was not unheard of. There was a smattering of case reports. And even more uh, anecdotal uh, people saying, yeah, I, I knew an elephant at such and such zoo back in 1920 uh, where a newspaper article said it died of TB. Or vets would say, yeah, I've seen TB and, and X number of animals uh, over time. Um, so those are what I call the old cases. There are a few more actually documented, so we can pull them up uh, uh, at a, on an a Internet search now. Uh, but they're out there. And as a resident back in the early 80s, I knew that elephants had TB, and I was looking forward, in a, in a sense, to finding a case of my own. Uh, unfortunately, my, uh, my wishes came true because we, we found uh, more cases. And what happened was, around 1996, um, a, a rather um, – two elephants became affected with TB uh, in, in a way that everybody was able to recognize. These were two traveling elephants – they were traveling in California, and one of them was very thin and was diagnosed as having a dental problem uh, or a, a medical problem, and subsequent to the workup for the medical problem, the anesthesia, it passed away and was diagnosed as having TB. So even though it wasn't unique in terms of the old cases, it was 
right there in the spotlight, and so everybody was forced to look, oh, wow, this elephant has human TB. That same part of that story, this, uh, another elephant in that group was en route back to its home herd and died and was necropsied in, Cal in Colorado and was also found to have TB. So two elephants from the same group uh, in a widely publicized case had uh, tuberculosis, and that's kind of what started our current discussion of TB, and that was uh, partially documented in, in this uh, reference that I have on the slide by Ryan at LA. Um, subsequent to that, there were some more cases that arose right around that time. I don't know, they weren't directly related, but they just started to pop up some more cases around the nation. And so an advisory panel was formed to, A, gather the information about this uh, and to try to come up with some um, recommendations. And um, some guidelines were produced uh, from these meetings, which basically show the progression of our understanding of the disease over time. So the first one of those guidelines came out in 1997, and there's been some subsequent, subsequent revisions. The current guideline that people are using, and this is the best reference to kind of get the state of the art or guidelines that's available, is the 2008. It can be found on the internet as a, pre, a, free, a freely available document. And there's a new, a new, uh, uh, guidelines being put out in 2010, which are going to be published shortly. So, estimate of prevalence. Uh, early on in this, at around 2001, uh, an epidemiological study estimated a prevalence of elephant TB in Asian elephants to be about 2 to 4 percent of the population. Subsequent to that, there's been other revisions of that prevalence uh, as time went on, and a very more recent publication, 2011, uh, estimated the population uh, prevalence to be 18%. And that was based on this data. There was a total of 50 animals in the United States at the time of publication that were diagnosed with TB. To see the majority, 46 of them were Asian elephants. That's why we're focusing our discussion on them. There was four cases in African elephants, three of them which were MTB also. One of them was M. Um But the 46 Asian elephants uh, is, is the number people were using to come up with 18%. Uh, and my question is, is you know, is, is this really increasing? Because if we're really going from 2 to 4% 10 years ago to 18% now, that's a pretty uh, a large increase. And I would say the primary reasons for this increase is more of the fact that after 1997, because of those guidelines, every elephant in the United States was required to be culture, cultured three times each year. These are trunk wash cultures, but it's every animal in the United States. So for the last 10 years, all 300 animals have been having cultured once a year. So that's a lot of testing of a population. And then also tied to that testing is mandatory reporting. So we're getting more cases because we're testing for it and we're reporting more cases. And I think that's a primary reason for this increase in, in prevalence. But I also want to question why is it really prevalence that's increasing? Prevalence, by definition, is the number of active or known cases in a cross-sectional population at a given point in time. So how many animals in the population actually have the disease at that point in time? And the 18 percent uh, is actually more of a cumulative incident because what it is is total number of cases, 46, divided by the current population at that point in time, when uh, 2010, when this was done. So 46 out of, uh, 46 out of 246 is about 18 percent or 19 percent. Uh, is more of a cumulative incidence than a true prevalence. So I went back uh, in preparation for this seminar and said, well, what is the actual prevalence if you use the definition I just talked about? So I picked a date, which was around the time they had done this, which is uh, beginning of 2010. Uh, from the stud book, knew how many animals were in the population and then uh, counted how many animals were diagnosed with tuberculosis. And the prevalence that I come up with is closer to 5%, and that is very different than 18 So. I decided to go back and really look at this carefully and looked at all the stud book data, which is stud book for elephants is all the animals' dates of birth of the whole population, basically a census. And 
calculated the prevalence at each point in time for every year since 1960. And what I found was that between 1960 and 1980, the prevalence was zero. How that, how, that's kind of contradictory, contradictory with what I said. There were cases in there. What's important was that those cases were all necropsy cases. They were found to be TB positive at necropsy, so they didn't contribute to the prevalence. Uh, back in 1980, there was one elephant that was treated, and from that point on, it survived and it stayed as a prevalent case in this population. But the important point is that uh, here, at 1997, is when we started doing the testing. And here you can start seeing, we start seeing animals that are both tested, reported, and then also treated, and they survive, and the prevalence climbs very steeply and then levels off at about the 5%. So in the years that we're testing, since so 1970, 1997, I estimate the population is leveled off at about 5%. If you look at incidents, these are actual cases, and again, this case was necrop this case was necropsy uh, died at ne uh, necropsy, so it wasn't included in the prevalence. This animal, one of these two animals, was treated, and that's the one after 1980. But you can see we start getting more cases after we start testing. Um, so I looked at calculating the incidence of density uh, out of curiosity of the new cases uh, that are coming from this uh, increased testing, how many cases per elephant year? And a uh, number I came up with in our population using that stud book, it's about eight animals per thousand elephant years. If you compare that to human data, um, like in Africa, there's more like three cases per thousand human years. So we have a pretty high incidence density, but again, this is a population that we very, very uh, rigorously have been uh, testing over time. So, Romero, is this a good point to take a break for some questions? Certainly. Or to leave the epidemiology. I think yeah. we had a couple of interesting questions from the audience. One was, um, if an animal is infected with M. tuberculosis from humans, can it then transmit that organism to another human? A I think question. hypothetical question, but I think uh, I would approach it at, from a microbiological point of view. It is we are talking about M tuberculosis, and M tuberculosis is a classic human disease. So once the human is infected, even if it came from the elephant, I see there's, there's no reason why that organism couldn't be shed to another human. So yes, I, th I think you would approach it less like any. MTB infection in a human and its risk to spreading it to Yeah, yeah I, I agree from the, from, the, from the human TB perspective. Um, and I think I saw a question um, that I also had, and maybe I missed this. Does TB not infect the African elephants, or it's just not detected? You've got to be real careful with not. Uh, actually, MTB has been found in three African cases in the United States, so it does. But if you, the relative prevalence, if I'm estimating uh, the relative prevalence uh, of 5% in Asian elephants, it's way below 1% in African elephants. So there's a lot of discussion as to why is there a biological difference between the Asian and African elephants? Uh, is it exposure difference? We don't know, we don't know the reason why, but it definitely seems to be, given the same exposure, presumably, Asian elephants tend to get this disease much more readily than African elephants. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to to, to uh, worldwide, um, I, this was a, a, a pretty extensive uh, case report out of Sweden where several elephants were found to be TB positive, um, and it spread to some other zoo animals. And I use this uh, to say that that. Um, European zoos have also had this problem and continue to have this problem. So it's not just the United States or North American problem. Uh, it's, ha it's prevalent in Europe also, probably at the same degree, although I haven't seen data from European collection as I've seen from the American collection. And then moving to other parts of the world, the range countries, in all of these range countries, there has been reports uh, of TB in the semi-domesticated animals, um, animals that are being kept by mahouts. Uh, and another in tourist situation, so that it is prevalent in other parts of the world. The question that really gets begged, though, is 
uh, is it a problem in wild elephants? And my answer to that is we don't know really because the wild elephants, A, are rare and kind of difficult to sample, and I just haven't seen documentation of it. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we could find what truly wild elephants well, the other, the other part of that question is um, because the semi-captive elephants intermingle quite a bit with a wild population, uh, it's sometimes hard to define uh, and an individual animal. Is it truly a wild elephant that's never seen humans, or is this a animal that's been exposed to other semi-domestic animals? So, Ramiro, we had a couple other questions that uh, might be more appropriate before you get into your next section. Uh, one is a local one. Uh, what's a mahout? Well, uh, mahu is a term used for um, people in the range countries of Asia that uh, culturally um, or professionally keep elephants. Uh, it's a term that's primarily Indian term, so it's not applicable to all the Asian range countries. They have different terms and names for them, but it's a way of saying people that professionally take care of elephants. Okay, great. And uh, another question from an audience member. Um, can TB be, be spread from elephants to other animals in zoos or circuses, and is there evidence for this? Yes, there is evidence that that there is evidence that MTB can be found in other animals in a zoo other than elephants, and there's evidence that some zoos with elephants that have TB have other animals like rhinoceros and giraffe, and even sometimes goats that have found TB in those animals too. What evidence is lacking is any direct evidence that says the elephant gave it to the other animal. And the reason that evidence was lacking is is because it takes a little bit of epidemiological uh, groundwork to figure out who gave it to whom. And right now we're lacking that. So all we can say right now is, yes, there's been several cases where zoo animals other than elephants were affected with MTB at a zoo that also had an elephant that had TB. And in, in those cases, were they matched by DNA fingerprinting? Uh, some preliminary work, yes. In some of those situations, they have shown that the RFLP type was very similar. Um, I haven't seen more detailed work um, that would prove that it was the exact same organism, but yes, there's certainly some evidence that it's a, in some of those situations, there's some evidence that a strain has passed back and forth between different species. Of course, in that situation, it's a bit like our household context studies. You don't know if those animals might have just had a similar exposure to an infected human. Yeah, it's, it's actually complicated. Yeah, you can think of a zoo as a household in that context, and but it's co complicated because you have the animals with varying degrees of susceptibility, and then you have the keepers that work with those animals. So you have to think about sort of the keepers and the animals in the same context of the household. Uh, and so it becomes a very interesting, in my opinion, interesting epidemiological question. Uh, and probably in some other practitioners, it might uh, be a confounding problem. I mean, it's, it's very complex. But uh, to say that three animals at three section, different sections of the zoo all had the same strain of TB, and there is examples of that, how did those animals share that? And one of the ways you could say is, well, it had to be a human walking between the different parts of the zoo. Uh, but right now, that's just speculation. I, I haven't seen proof, epidemiological proof of how it works. Well, and you're, you've generated a lot of questions here. So there's one about, uh, in follow-up to that, have you done any comparative genomics? There's been RFLP work done on, on several isolates of um, elephant isolates from around the country. So that's preliminary. There's people that are definitely working on spoliotyping as many strains as they can have. Um, I'm hopefully going to be involved with some of that, too. So it, people are working on that idea, but right now it hasn't. Uh, it, it isn't that well known. The, the, the work that has come out is that two things are true. Is one is uh, there seem to be a lot of different strains in the elephants. It's not one single strain through all the elephants that, that have been sampled. And then a subsection of that is some elephants do share a similar strain, so that you can follow it in a herd from elephant to elephant and they share a similar strain. But the same herd may also have un totally unrelated strains from other elephants. So it's a complex question and it's just be they're just beginning to look at it. Okay. So just for the audience members, a few questions have come in that I think Romero may address in the subsequent sections. So we'll, uh, we'll let you get on with it. Okay, so moving on. Um, go to kind of the uh, gross part of this. Um, 
Necropsy uh, is the ultimate way to make a diagnosis of TB on almost any species. Uh, and we certainly recommend that uh, all elephants, uh, should they need to be necropsy, get a full necropsy. And for the human people, necropsy is the animal version of autopsy. So we, we, we um, literally need to look at these animals in detail after they die and particularly answer the question of how, if they have TB. And as you may imagine, necropsying an elephant is quite a, an endeavor, as this picture shows. Uh, pathology of elephants is not that much different than pathology in humans. Uh, you get uh, varying degrees of pathology in the lung from almost the whole lung being affected in some very bad terminal cases to very minor areas of pathology, focal areas of pathology. Here are two examples of what I call intermediate. These are fairly small chunks of tissue, but they have pretty extensive uh, granulomatous uh, and uh, miliary distribution, and, and these are basically the classic active TB lesions that you would find in an elephant. The older lesions are calcified like they are in humans, and at necropsy, you run your knife through this uh, granuloma, and it's actually like cutting part of a rock. Uh, it's very uh, calcified and, and very fibrous and essentially walled off. Uh, you can confirm your uh, diagnosis at necropsy with histopathology, similar as to humans, HNA stains. You can also ask for specialty stainings like acid fast or you know, histochemistry to make your diagnosis. Ultimately, we rely on culture of necropsy specimens to confirm that we are actually definitely looking at a TB case. Uh, and you can also use molecular techniques on tissues such as PCR. So. All those methodologies are pretty straightforward in a necropsy sample. I wanted to bring this picture and idea to you because there's several places that uh, people that say, well, the what are the classic clinical signs in elephants? And in the textbook, you say a thin elephant like this, weight loss, coughing, uh, exercise intolerance. This would be your ideal uh, I of what an elephant would, you would think would look like. I want to stress that this picture and this presentation is actually very rare. Uh, I've only seen something like this in terminal cases, uh, and that's very rarely. An elephant like this can easily have uh, other diseases, such as cancers. There have seen several cases like this with uterine cancers, uh, other infectious agents, um, and dental problems, for that matter of fact, they, they can't chew. So I'm just saying uh, you can't diagnose an animal just by its clinical signs. And in fact, I want to stress as part of the learning process of this webinar is that most elephants that we have identified with TB have no clinical signs and normal physical examination, just like that case report that I started with. Uh, and that brings up an interesting finding is that so we've seen some elephants at, at necropsy that died of other reasons, that when we do a complete necropsy, we find evidence of TB. And this is an example with that arrow points to one of those chronic nodules. And that's a very small nodule compared to the size of the lung, and it's very calcified. And the question becomes, is this, was this significant to this animal? Yes, we culture TB out of it, so by definition the animal has TB, but was this an important part of this animal's uh, clinical problems? Which brings up uh, a rather novel idea for veterinarians, and that is that elephants might have latent infection, and in my opinion actually do. Uh, and this is uh, novel to veterinarians because we don't consider cattle or primates as having latent infections. On the human side, latent infection is a hallmark of TB. And what I think is that elephants are more similar to humans in this regard than the other species that I'm used to taking care of. So latency, meaning the animal is perfectly normal, meaning there is no way of, there's no culture positive findings on the animal, no clinical signs of disease in the animal, uh, but yet it seems to be holding an infection somewhere in its body. That's what I mean by latency, and that, that's directly analo uh, analogous to a uh, human with latent infection. Well, Romero, let me ask you about your initial case. So what I struggle with is when you have an animal that appears perfectly well, but you get a positive culture on the trunk wash. In, in humans, that's a similar appear, uh, presentation has been described as subclinical TB, you know, maybe that we're finding things very early uh, before the disease progresses. 
Uh, any thoughts on the elephant side? Yeah, I would, I would assume that you're human, that, that you would at that point say this, this human is no longer latent because you were able to culture. Correct. And that's, I think, the same way I think of that elephant. That at, the time, at the time we got a culture, culture positive out of the animal, he is no longer a latently infected animal. He's A, confirmed with diagnosis, of, you know, has MTB because we have the culture, and B, we were culturing it outside of his body, so he is shedding it into the environment, at least at that point in time. Uh, and then we approach it the same way you would for the, the similar human. At, at that point, I would presume as a physician, you would start treatment on that human because obviously he's, this individual is shedding. And well, we would get a chest x-ray, but you'll get into that, I'm sure. Actually, right here, we'll get into that. So I've, I've, I've belabored the point that we don't see too many clinical signs or symptoms in these animals, so you can't really use a physical exam. It's false advertisement to me putting an elephant in an exam room because uh, I really can't hear its lungs with a stethoscope. Um, but uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is skin testing. And elephants early on was shown to be really unreliable. And we abandoned it as a diagnostic test, a regulatory test, very quickly. Two major reasons is they're, they're pachyderms. The skin of these animals is not very conducive for skin testing. Uh, there is a place behind the ear, and maybe the tail fold, you can do a TB test, but it, they generally have much thicker skin. And then secondly, they seem to be nonspecific reactors, and there's some other species that are like, the, like a horse. Um, so we abandon that. X-rays, everybody's tried, everybody's failed. There's no way to get uh, a good image of the thorax. Even a large horse is questionable to get a good thoracic image, a good diagnostic image. And an elephant three or four times bigger than a horse. So not likely. Uh, I put CT in there sort of as a joke because I haven't seen a CT with a boar size big enough to hold an elephant <laughs> chest. Um, but, I mean, that, that's where we'd go with humans. Uh, and then bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy is not a joke, actually. The theoretically, you could run an endoscope far enough down uh, to collect lung samples. problem with it is the two-meter scopes we use in equine or horse medicine don't even begin to get down far enough. So you have to have a specially made, probably five meter scope uh, to really do it. And then you'd also need general anesthesia. So it couldn't be used as a routine test. It's a lot of fiber optics. Um, let, me, let me ask uh, one question before you get too far from the pathology. This came in from the audience. Have, have you found granulomas in other organs, i.e. extrapulmonary lesions in elephants? Absolutely, um, but rarely. I, I wanted to stress that it's Primarily, this disease is a pulmonary disease in elephants. So I wanted to get that point across first. And then you do have exceptions. We've seen cases of uh, uterine infection. We've seen cases of uh, uh, mesenteric lymph node infection. So it does go septicemic at some point in its pathology uh, and sp potentially spread to other places. I haven't seen bone myself, and I haven't seen CNS uh, TB, but I have seen uterine and, and, and non-pulmonary lymph node. Well, in humans, over 85, 90% is, is pulmonary. Yeah, so the analogy is very similar to humans. Okay, so currently the test that people are using primarily to figure out if an elephant has TB at its active is the culture, as in our case report. So this involves getting a sample, which we'll talk about in a second. It's called a trunk wash. Um, and the way you do that, uh, this may be novel to some people that are used to working with humans. Uh, what I'm trying to, what we're trying to do here is get the equivalent of a sputum sample. But it's hard to tell an elephant to cough into a cup. So what we do is we train the elephant to let you lift up its trunk, as this picture is showing, and then we put in 60 mils of sterile saline. We put it into the trunk, we lift up the trunk, shake it all around, and then lower the trunk and ask the animal to exhale into a plastic baggie. And we're trying to collect a sample like this, which is a, a, a trunk wash sample. It is contaminated but with whatever else was in the trunk. So a lot of times we see dirt and hay in there. But it, always, uh, it should contain a fair amount of mucus. And this is what we're currently using as the best way of getting a quote-unquote sputum sample from our patients. And these elephants can be routinely trained to do this, so it's not a big deal for most of the elephants. And that's exactly how we diagnosed our, our uh, case report. 
Interestingly, the, we, we diagnosed him that one day as a surprise, but then we did subsequent cultures on him and, reala- and found it positive multiple days, which to me, I want to bring up that this test, although not perfect by any means, uh, once an animal becomes positive, it's usually pretty easy to, to get them multiple times in that, in that near, near time frame. Um, it also begs the question, uh, uh, positive, uh, positive culture means the animal has TB. What does a negative culture mean? And it can be looked at in two ways. A negative culture means to some people that uh, that you fail to culture an, uh, the TB from an animal that has it, but it also can be the animal wasn't shedding that particular day. So he made a, this animal had 10 year, or, yeah, about 10 years of negative cultures prior to being positive. Uh, and so you can look at it both ways, but you, you have to realize that positive culture is positive. And a negative culture just gives you one small piece of information, and, and, some, and it's relative to the next culture that you do. You find the same thing with humans. Yeah, uh, humans you have to mul- culture multiple times often to get a positive. Okay, so it's definitive. That's why I like we like the culture. Uh, it allows you to do drug sensitivity, which is important when you go into to treat an elephant. And then it allows you through DNA genotyping to answer some of these uh, DNA question, uh, epidemiological questions that we were answering, uh, talking about earlier. So having the, the bug in hand has a lot of benefits to it. That's why I like it as an antemortem test. You can also try, but haven't been validated, things like PCR and versions of PCR to look for antigens other than the culture. Uh, and then there's some other other tests out there like electronic noses or training rats to smell TB um, that all potentially could work, but none of these have been validated. Uh, so I can't really say how well they work in elephants. Well, Romero, this speaks to a question from the audience we just got um, about the sensitivity of trunk wash. Do we know? It's tough to have a gold standard, I would imagine. Yeah, it's hard to establish a gold standard when it is the gold standard. Um, and that's been a, a, a subject of a lot of debates. And it goes back to that question, um, that elephant that I have as a case report that was positive one day but negative the year before, was the year before and all those other cultures we've done for the last 10 years all false negatives? Or were they true negatives and the animal wasn't shedding at that time? But since we don't have a gold standard, maybe PCR would give that to us. We don't have a gold standard to compare the culture to. It's very hard to give that to say, say that. We use the culture as the gold standard, quote unquote, um, to, ask, to, to look at sensitivity and specificity of these other tests that we're going to talk about, but you can't use it as a gold standard against itself. So other tests that are out there, we're moving to from antigen tests like culture to antibody tests. And um, antibodies are part of the humoral immune system, uh, and it's not necessarily where the action is in TB, as many of the people in this audience would know. Uh, but it is something that's out there and it's, it's practical to do. So you can design ELISA tests, and these are all very similar to the ELISA tests and SNAP tests that have been marketed for humans. Uh, WHO has recently produced a, a statement that says these tests should not probably not be used as sole diagnostic tests in, uh, anywhere uh, because, again, they're measuring antibody and humoral immunity to a organism that is primary primarily a cellular uh, disease. Um, as a research tool, I've used serology um, in my laboratory to follow elephants over time, and I like it as an epidemiological tool. Uh, this is a quick example of an elephant that I followed over 20 years, starting uh, in 1990 uh, to 2010. And these are titers, which are kind of irrelevant as far as actual numbers, but what is relevant is this red line is my negative cutoff for my particular ELISA test that I developed for, the, for, for my research. And from the beginning of sampling that animal, before I even knew the animal, uh, it had positive titer. Uh, all these are low positive titers. And then at some point it started increasing. At about this point, this animal became culture positive. At about this point, it started being treated. And we've seen that the treating that animal has brought down its titer. I'm not exactly sure why at this point. That's an intellectual discussion. But it brought it down to actually at or below my cutoff level for many years. Now it's starting to increase a little bit and then dip down again a little bit. So 
at this point, it's bouncing around my, my threshold. And again, as an epidemiologist, I'm trying to figure out if this is a useful tool to tell me, you know, is this a residual titer after the animal has been successfully treated? Or is this a titer that's starting to rebound because maybe the animal is, is still infected? Uh, so as a research tool, um, it's useful. And you, I, you can get a what I call a titergram on, on animal over time. It tells you a lot. On the market, uh, there are uh, rapid tests out there, stat packs, uh, that diagnose TB in elephants and marketed for elephants. Not available to the general public in the United States, uh, regulated by the USDA, and they use it, but available internationally. Uh, so other parts of the world can get a hold of this. And the, the beauty of this test is that um, you can just put a drop of blood in this well, then put some diluent in there, and watch by lateral flow, it, it produces a, a blue line uh, and the control, so that means the test is working. And then on a test, it could produce, produces a, another little blue line. So that's a positive stat pack, and the second one here. And this third one is a very positive stat pack. So that's a good example of first a negative, then a, a positive, and then a positive. Very convenient because they could be done literally elephant side. Um, but they're one-time serological tests. So uh, you need to interpret that with a little, with a little bit of care. This uh, test system is uh, backed up by a secondary test, a confirmatory test, uh, where you send it into the laboratory for a MAPIA test. And the conceptual difference is the stat pack, that little blue line represents about 10 antigens that are pooled together to be reactive. And then a PIA test separates out those individual antigens and produces individual blue lines for each individual antigen. So you have a better idea of what that serum is reacting to uh, with this test versus the, the original stat pack test. So you run the stat pack test. If it's positive, you send it in for a MAPIA test. And that's, again, not available to the general public or veterinarians in this country, but regulated by USDA at this point in time. Moving on to a completely different kind of test, and that's the cellular immune test. And uh, right now, um, I've mentioned the skin test is not useful, and that's a cellular immune test. It's not useful in elephants. Uh, IGRAs potentially could do the same thing and are potentially very useful, but unfortunately no one has validated these for elephants. Uh, but it could be easily done uh, if, you, if you just modify the reagents to detect elephant antibodies to interfere on. So I think that's something in the future. And this is the important, uh, the important uh, slide in this part, and that is you know, the parable of the three blind men and the elephant. Uh, which diagnostic test is actually the best one? And that's a lot of debate depending on what you're looking for. So I think the first question is, are you trying to identify if an animal is infected, period, including latent? Or are you trying to identify if they're active and dangerously and dangerous and, 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 and secreting organisms into the environment? That dictates which test you use. I mean, if I'm trying to find out if an animal is actually shedding, my culture is a better choice. If I'm trying to find out if the animal's been exposed or infected, serology may work for that. Uh, another thing is, is the test being going to be used as an epidemiological tool, or is it going to be used as a regulatory test? And put it in human terms, is it going to be used as a tool to understand the epidemiology, or is it going to be used to dictate treatment or, 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 uh, or reporting criteria? So you have to be to pick the best test that fits those. And then finally, you have to have a good understanding of what your test is actually detecting. Is it ant detecting antigen and showing you evidence of the organism there? Is it detecting antibody, which is kind of out of the frame of, uh, of what this disease does? Or is it detecting cellular immunity? So, uh, Romero, before you leave the diagnostics realm, uh, we have a, a reverse diagnostics question. Um, is there any application for elephant uh, TB stat pack in humans? Yes, refer to the WHO, uh, uh, WHO uh, publication where there's dozens of them out there internationally um, with varying amounts of sensitivity and specificity. And that paper did a meta-analysis and, and compared them all. So this is not technology that was developed for elephants. This is technology that was adapted from humans 
uh, used an elephant. So there's plenty of examples of that technology used. Now, I certainly don't want to be quoted as saying use this uh, elephant step back on humans. It's absolutely not acceptable. Well, and as you mentioned, the WHO has come out quite uh, strongly uh, against the use of serology, some of these serologic tests for humans. I mean, we have we have nice tools with the interferon gamma release assays. And as a human TB person, I would say uh, definitely not. And I've been in this discussion with several people. I, other than for epidemiological tool, I don't like the serological test as a regulatory or, di or diagnostic test. And I'm 100% behind what I'm reading in the WHO documents. Um, it's just, it, to quote uh, a friend of mine, uh, looking at serology is like bringing a, a knife to a gunfight. Uh, you're just looking at the wrong thing. So I would prefer to use a cellular immune system uh, like IGRA uh, or ideally an antigen detecting test for my diagnostic test. And serology, I put aside. Yep. Yep. Any more questions or no, moving no, on? Okay. Now we're moving on to treatment of TB. And this could be another two-hour seminar by itself because this brings a whole realm of issues. I would just like to give you a taste of it uh, just so you understand the, the basics of it. The first big question was, what's the pharmacokinetics? Uh, we can't assume the pharmacokinetics of a drug is the same in a human, a rat, and then extrapolate to an elephant. Uh, so there was some basic pharmacokinetics done early on uh, on uh, population kinetics of several of the human anti-tuberculosis drugs in elephants. And we have a, a, a fairly good idea uh, of the kinetics of many of these drugs. This is a table out of the guidelines, and I, I, I don't want you to look at it for details, uh, but primarily, it, it's Note that it's using multiple drug therapy. We're talking about using all, at least all of these four drugs on the animal at the same time. That's similar to humans. We're using the same human drugs. And if you look at the drug dosages, they're roughly similar to humans' uh, drug dosages. Uh, the other thing I want you to, the next thing I want you to look at is the far right, and that is we're actually doing therapeutic drug monitoring on each one of these animals. So it's, uh, that's a little step beyond what they typically do in humans, but we're trying to hit drug levels to document that we're getting the drug into the animal. Now, those target drug levels are, are uh, a bit subjective, how they're set and what is a, an, a, an adequate drug level. But for the guidelines, that's what we're going with right now. Uh, for those of you who, who did read and looked and you saw one of these drugs, actually two of these drugs going in rectally, that is true. We're looking at different ways of getting these drugs in than you would typically think in a human. Uh, elephants are notorious for not liking to take their medicine, and there's no way you can make a 10,000-pound a, a, a elephant swallow its uh, is an eyeside, even if you you, know, you can't make them do it. So uh, rectal provides a, another avenue, and we're getting great drug levels in certain drugs rectally. So kind of a, a nuance there. Uh, uh, not on this slide, but a very important is almost all the animals that we've treated have gotten sick from the treatment at one point or other during these uh, treatments. So these are not nice drugs to the elephant. And my understanding of human medicine is similar. A lot of humans get sick with their drugs during their time of treatment. So we have to look at that as veterinarians. Uh, another important point is cases that we've worked with as a group, they're shedding, and that's why we start them on this medicine, we quickly find that they stop shedding soon after these drugs are started. So in that sense, we're, we believe these drugs are effective, at least on the short term, of shutting these animals down. Uh, and that is a good thing. And we've seen that fairly consistently in the animals we've worked with. The last issue, and this is one of the ones we can get into a long discussion about, is what is the appropriate length of therapy? Um, it depends on whether you're trying to treat prophylactically, which these guidelines do have uh, a treatment regime for that, in which case we're talking about nine months, or if you're treating for a known shedder, like the case that I brought up. I, the guidelines now say a year. I actually personally clinically recommend at least two years of treatment on these animals uh, because we don't really know how long is enough to truly cure them. Just to put that in perspective, each animal that gets treated is going to cost about $100,000 a year. Uh, that's not a small amount of money. 
That includes the drugs. Literally, the drugs have to be bought by the bucketful. Uh, we count out EIs and IIsides in the hundreds of pills on a daily basis. Uh, so there's a lot of logistical issues and some monetary issues associated with this. So it, it's a pretty big logistical uh, endeavor to treat one of these animals. I don't know, Romero, I, I think we need to get you a couple of our TB nurses. They can get patients to take just about anything. I'll be <laughs> glad to go out there. I've heard of all kinds of tricks. Um, I, uh, just kidding. Yeah, the tricks do work sometimes, uh, but it's often try, it's very hard to fool an elephant twice. Some of these tricks work once. <laughs> but if you have to have a year's worth of therapy. Okay, so now I want to really switch gears, uh, and look at this as a zoonotic disease. So I've hopefully given you a background of what elephants TB is in elephants. So, Again, we've talked about this, but uh, classic zoonosis is animal to human. Reverse zoonosis is human to animal. And then I want to put in a third one as a concept, which may be what this disease is, and this is a, a disease that's equally shared between animals and humans. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I don't think we're actually there at this point to say it's a shared zoonosis, Right now, it's primarily a reverse zoonosis, but I'd like to, for discussion's sake, think of it, it might actually be a shared. And we've been over this, and this is where uh, we brought up guinea pigs are a lab animal for this. So all these animals have had TB, but none of them had TB as case reports in very rare cases, but none of them carry this disease naturally, whereas elephant does. So as a zoonosis, it has been reported once in the literature as a documented zoonosis. This is a case related to those two cases that died in California and Colorado uh, at their home collection in Illinois. Uh, there was a documented case of a human with clinical signs of TB that was subsequently cultured and a set of elephants at that same facility and they all shared the same genotype, or RFLP type to be specific. Uh, so it, it was definitely a, zoo a documented case of zoonotic transmission. What this case report failed to do, because of, they didn't have all the evidence, is to say whether the elephants gave it to the person or the person gave it to the elephants. And that remains a big question in this disease. So epidemiological studies that are out there, uh, there was one study where in LA Zoo where they, they called, after TB was found in, in elephants and other species in that zoo, uh, they, they did skin testing on the whole uh, employee population, occupational employees of the zoo, and found a, um, a, a prevalence of about 20%. Uh, and when they called out the ones that, um, that had converted during that point of time, it was fell down to about 5% of the employees. Now, that had no relevance to whether they worked at, with elephants or not. In the Hawthorne private collection, which was the index collection, they went back to the Illinois and sample the elephant keepers that were working with that collection. It's a fairly large collection of elephants. And, and found on first screening, 50% of the employees had a positive skin test. Most of them had prior history of positive tests, so the actual conversion was not, they weren't able to uh, calculate the conversion due to working with the elephants. But certainly a lot of people were having positive skin tests. And very recently, Murphy uh, described an epidemiological study out of Tennessee where 18% um, uh, of the people screened uh, were positive for TB out of, this, uh, uh, out of this group of people that included elephant workers, administrative people, and maintenance people. And we'll discuss that a little more in detail in, in, in the discussion section. But I just want to put out there that in the population of elephant workers or zoos in general, probably the incidence of positive skin tests is higher than you would expect in the general population. Uh, of Americans. So why elephant workers? Uh, some of the things that might make it unique, they're working with animals that have TB. We've already established that as a, as a discussion point. But they work very closely with these animals. Um, you know, no one really gets really close to the polar bear for reasons that it's a polar bear. But elephants, including the elephants in range countries where the mahouts are working with them, they have a literally very close relationship with these animals. And this is a picture um, kind of illustrating that, uh, how close people get to them. The other thing about 
elephants is they have elephant barns, and uh, they're oftentimes rather enclosed spaces. So uh, it's similar to some of the enclosed spaces we talk about as risk factors for, for human transmission of TB, such as a bus. Um, these barns can be enclosed spaces. There's a subgroup of elephant workers that also travel. And this uh, subgroup uh, travels from place to place, usually in circuses or other traveling um, situations. They share close living quarters both with the elephants, as I pointed out, but they also live closely together as they travel uh, and, and very close communities. Many of these uh, traveling units uh, include foreign-born performers, uh, so there's, a, there's another risk factor. And there's uh, other risk factors uh, associated with uh, these traveling units. So we can look at, at that as a reason why we have a higher incidence of skin testing. I'd like to put in veterinarians, which I'm one of them. Um, every time you do a trunk washing tech, uh, procedure, you're pretty making it, you're getting very close to the elephant, obviously, and the respiratory secretions. Every time you treat an elephant, uh, you're close to an elephant with tuberculosis. And when I do necropsies, uh, you're potentially very exposed to uh, tuberculosis. So I include veterinarians as, as an occupational risk. Obviously, there's environmental factors, which we'll talk about in a little more detail, but um, these barns uh, can have ventilation issues. They can have high humidity. They can have high temperatures. Um, they can all contribute to the potential. And the, the place that best talks about this is a, a um, article by Davis in 2001. He's one of the first um, people to write a uh, OSHA he was from OSHA, and he did an inspection of an elephant facility and kind of outlined what he was looking for and talk about some of the things I just breezed over here. Uh, but he was one of the fir was first to actually put it on paper uh, that, that elephant work may be a, a unique occupational risk. So I, I recommend digging up that paper uh, for those of you who want more information on that. So right now, um, state of the art. Um, what are we doing about these occupational risks? Uh, certainly screening the, the workers uh, with skin tests and chest radiographs, if, if necessary, is talked about. This is an excerpt from the guidelines, and it more specifically says what I just said, which is uh, employees uh, in direct contact with elephants should be tested for TB annually. Uh, so that's the guidelines a lot of people use. Uh, it's debatable whether it's the actual best way to go. If you're working with a known TB positive animal, the, these guidelines recommend further steps, uh, like wearing uh, protection, personal protection, and possibly separating animals out. So in summary, what do we know about elephants TB? We know it's MTB, not bovis. We know it's Asian elephants, primarily. We estimate the prevalence about 6 to 5%, at least I do, based on the data I've seen primarily a pulmonary infection, and I'm pretty convinced there is a latency period in elephants that is unique uh, to animals, or almost unique to animals, uh, but seen commonly in humans. So, Rivera, let me, let me stop you here for a minute and just uh, address a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, one is, uh, do elephants get any type of immunodeficiency viruses or HIV? The easy answer is no. There's no recognized uh, infectious agents that are directly immunosuppressive, uh, such as the two that you re recommend. My academic answer is probably. Pretty much all animals that you look hard enough in have some of these retroviruses or other viruses that can definitely modulate the immune system. Um, our trick is to find it in elephants and then to find out if it's relevant to this TB issue. Uh, but right now, we don't know of any specifically. Okay. Another question was, does MDRTB occur in elephants? Has it been identified? Uh, that's actually a very good question. And MDR, meaning multiple, um, yes, there's been two published uh, cases discussed um, that pan-sensitive organisms were identified, treatment occurred in the elephant, and then uh, drug-resistant organisms were subsequently re-identified later on. So it does occur, and it's a major consideration for somebody 
that's looking at treating these animals. I would say it does also occur in humans, so it's not unique to elephants. I would say majority of the animals that have been treated haven't resulted in that, um, but it's certainly something of concern. It's one of the reasons why I think we do need to have a healthy debate as to how long should we really treat these elephants and with what drugs. So there's room for good debate on it. Then another question was, um, if we know what the risk is to persons who have indirect uh, contact, such as custodial staff who are cleaning out barns? The little evidence that's out there in those three case reports don't really talk about custodial work or maintenance work as being a direct risk factor. Oh, the one out of LA Zoo did mention that maybe, uh, but then kind of backed off of it because many of those people may have had pre-existing skin test positive. Um, so no, no one's directly looked at that. I, I think common sense would be that humans that work very closely and exposed to the same environments with elephants and breathe in the same air would would have equal amount of risk. I focus on the elephant workers because they're the ones that are there day to day with these animals. So in my studies, that's where I think if we're going to find uh, an occupational risk, uh, that's where I think we're really going to find it. Yeah, that makes sense. And then uh, one last question for now. Have uh, elephants ever been given BCG vaccine? Mm, not that I'm aware of in this country, ever. Uh, and not that I'm aware of in other countries, although I'm not, I'm, I can't be aware of what I'm not aware of. Um, and the rationale for not using BCG in this country, at least, has been similar to the rationale for not using BCG uh, in uh, humans. Uh, and also, from a veterinary perspective, uh, the BCG vaccination might really confound our diagnostic tests. So that's another reason, historically, we haven't used it. Okay, moving on. What we don't know sometimes dwarfs what we know, and I'd like to make sure we all recognize that. Uh, we don't really know where these animals are getting this disease. There's been some speculations. One is that, well, maybe it's a wild animal endemic disease, and these elephants literally are brought over from Asia with this disease. They have a long latency period, and we're seeing this disease later on. I haven't seen much evidence to support that. The next one is, well, maybe they're infected in Asia, but not by other elephants, but by mahouts. So during the capture process, a lot of these animals live in these semi-domesticated situations, sometimes for years before they're brought over to the United States. And again, they're long latency period, and we see this later on in life. There is actually some reason to believe that it's some evidence to that. Uh, finally, uh, you know, could the keepers be giving this to the elephants? In, the, in North America, that's certainly a possibility. And then there's some tra some direct transmission elephant to elephant uh, noted, but as a veterinarian, I haven't seen a lot of evidence that this is a disease that spreads easily or readily between elephants in a captive population. To say that again, I have seen cases that look like they went from one elephant to the, to the next, but I haven't seen cases where it's spread evenly throughout the whole herd. In other words, it wasn't easily spread elephant to elephant. I think the middle two are probably the most likely. This is most likely a reverse zoonosis of some type. Either the moot or the keepers are the ultimate source. But right now, that's still an unknown. Uh, the other next unknown is um, we don't know how it's maintained in the population, so we don't know, again, if it's spread elephant to elephant. We expect that the latency has something to do with the epidemiology, but we haven't really investigated that. And we haven't fully investigated the idea of reverse zoonosis. The real question for me as a researcher is, what is the true occupational risk of this problem? Um, and I can point to evidence, as I have, that uh, there's been a case report, one, and there's been some epidemiological studies, kind of preliminarily. So probably occurs, but really how often does it really occur? How many people who work with elephants for 40 years have actually gotten TB from their elephants? And that is work that hasn't been done, so that's a question that I think we don't know. And with that, I'll kind of finish up my, my professor lecture portion uh, and start talking about more questions and also um, uh, looking for some discussion if, if we want to go down that route. So a couple of questions I've formulated to stimulate discussion. 
This is sort of a informational for you listening. Uh, what species of elephants tends to get MTB? And I think that point was uh, pretty quickly, uh, pretty well established. Paying attention. Here's another one. Uh, the typical case of elephant tuberculosis is associated with clinical signs. And I think fault is what I was trying to put forth to everyone. Typically, we don't see sick elephants with TB. And that makes uh, diagnosing of these animals antimortically very tricky. This is uh, more of a discussion question. Um, what are the major causes of the increasing prevalence of TB in the United States? Uh, is it that we're really increasing from 2% or 4% to 18%. And again, this gets back to that point where I was saying, I think we're seeing a lot of TB in elephants because we're looking for it and we're reporting it, as opposed to 50 years ago where we were doing neither. And so if you take a population of 300 elephants and, and uh, trunk wash them every year in perpetuity, you're likely to find more and more cases. So right now we're at about 50. So you wouldn't be surprised in another 10 years we may have 20 more. Um, but is this really because there's that many more animals out there? Uh, when do you consider an elephant definitively diagnosed with uh, tuberculosis? And uh, this has to do with the diagnostic test and interpretation of the diagnostic test. Um, the first answer is if you culture the animal, you've got a definitive diagnosis, and I've said that several times, so I think that should be probably everybody's best choice. The second choice, serological evidence, to me, doesn't give direct definitive diagnosis. The third one is important because this one says positive culture and serological diagnosis. And this is important because logically you would think you should have both together, but I have seen cases where that's not the case, where an animal was shedding the organism, but there was no serological evidence of disease. So I would not wait for both to become true to to uh, make sure we have a diagnosis. So I think this point was well taken. Uh, everybody pretty much has chosen that one. Okay, so now I want to switch gears and take, take this more to a discussion realm. And I, at the beginning I said I've got some um, potential cases, hypothetical cases, and this is the first one. Uh, I call it elephants are coming to town, or, uh, but elephants are being imported to a local zoo. Uh, the zoo wants to do some breeding. Uh, they come from another another institution, and the, gen the, the media and the general public are concerned because they've been reading about elephant TV both in maybe local media or the internet. Those specifics on this case would be that these are going to be three new elephants, um, all female breeding age, uh, prime. Uh, prime breeding age, one of them has a serological test, antibody positive for TB. All three of them have been cultured four years in a row and are negative. Four years of treat, uh, culturing and they're negative. And none of them have a direct exposure to a positive animal from the institution they came from. So with those uh, parameters in mind, uh, as a public health expert, um, what do you tell the media when the media asks, are, should we bring this, this animal to the zoo? Should, should we allow this to happen? Is this a danger? And uh, think about it, uh, to prompt some discussions, do we, uh, and I'll entertain any questions that come up from it. Uh, practically, what can we, what could you recommend that the zoo do, do to these animals to alleviate the public uh, concern and to make you as a professional more uh, comfortable that these animals either do or do not have tuberculosis. And I see some results coming in. Uh, I think uh, the majority of them are yellow or the trunk washes, which is actually the most practical thing you can do is a, a stress. Radiographs can't be done. Skin testing doesn't seem to work. Bronchoscopy, not, not very likely. So, yes, um, I would consider... The, uh, serially culturing these animals is probably the best practical measure you could do to uh, help alleviate the public's concern. So, Romero, there's a, a question that came up uh, relative to this case. Um, are elephants routinely tested for TB prior to importation to the U.S.? 
Uh, that's actually the answer would be yes, but the strong caveat, and I probably failed to make this point, is elephants are not imported into the United States anymore because of CITES permitting. Uh, for the last 30 years, it's been difficult uh, to import Asian elephants uh, into the United States. Um, so when I say coming to the United States, it's usually about 30 years ago. Some people have been bringing over some African elephants, and yes, there's some strict testing that's being done. My understanding, at least in the African elephants, is they haven't found positive animals. Uh, the other part of that question, though, is there's very strict um, uh, screening of animals before they're transferred within the United States, and that's what this case was bringing up. Okay, so moving on, um, this question, uh, what precautions would you take? Uh, this is actually a question without a direct answer. I was just trying to see if there was going to be a, a, a differences of opinion. Um, but the, the first one is probably the most practical, and 100% of the people have chosen it, which is to try to quarantine those animals that are coming in. However, the practical is how long you're going to quarantine, because if you quarantine forever, you're not going to have any breeding. So you have to discuss how long the quarantine period will be and how much is reasonable. Uh, based on the available information, uh, would you think these elephants, as I presented, would be safe to put in a public display, in other words, at the zoo, uh, separated by a moat? And uh, this is actually a practical question that I was dealing with at a couple of zoos that I, I, I dealt with. Um, majority of the people are, are saying yes, and I would agree. Uh, being outside, having a reasonable distance between the animals and the public, given that these animals aren't even proven infected, I think is a reasonable thing to say. So I would get in front of the media and be comfortable saying yes. Okay, the second question is actually more a uh, human question, and this is a worker that wants an annual PPD test because it's being mandated by the zoo that she works at. Uh, and just to put it in a, a, a context of the case report or case history, 35-year-old Hispanic female, uh, prior medical history, the only reason that she's been seen recently, uh, five years ago, was she was bitten by a monkey because she's an animal keeper. She has mild asthma and HIV negative. So setting up a fairly healthy person with some other animal exposure Worked with primates for six years and then moved to the elephant house and has worked with elephants for four years. Hasn't had other PPD uh, testing up until now and currently has no clinical signs or self-reported symptoms. So one thing I want to add in there, though, is she tells you that she's been working with a known positive elephant. So I want to add that in as a little bit of spice for the questions. So in your opinion, is um, generally on any animal worker, from what I've said so far, do you think it's warranted to, for the zoo to, war to expect an annual PPD for its employees? Does this make sense to everyone? And the preponderance uh, of the votes are yes, and that would agree with, that, with the guidelines and would agree with uh, a lot of people that have been involved in this field. Um, so I think that puts you in the mainstream of, of the literature. The second question is, uh, if you're a clinician for this, for this human, uh, what would you want uh, further from this person? And this is a very debatable question. Uh, Dr. Finley and I had this conversation uh, a couple days ago. Uh, and basically pointed out there's no right answer to this question. Uh, but what I am seeing um, as the leader is what I would choose. I would choose both more history and radiographs. Uh, so and purple answer. Uh, and then the second runner-up is going to be all of the above. That's uh, aggressive uh, diagnostics there, and I think none of them would be a wrong choice. Would you have changed that last question, answered the last question, or your approach to this client if she had been told, if, you had to, if she hadn't told you she had worked with a positive elephant? And my point here is the answer would probably no, because things really haven't changed. Uh, at this point, she presents like anybody else that may present for consult for tuberculosis and may have had a known exposure. Um, I think we're going to wrap up.
and leave some time for discussions uh, and move to our conclusions. And I wanted to, to conclude with, with this kind of overall summary of what I think Elephant TV is. I start out in the first um, uh, section talking about latency, pointing out that humans have a known long latency. Elephants have a latency, but we don't know after long. And all other animals that I'm aware of, we don't recognize a latency. In the next uh, major category is the active disease when the animal is, or humans are shedding. Um, elephants and humans are again similar, uh, whereas most other animals like primates are usually very symptomatic. El and, and humans and elephants are similar in that um, clinical signs uh, and, uh, and symptoms are often not overt. And then the final one is important because uh, treatment in humans, we're pretty comfortable. We have uh, curative multi-drug treatments that are well tested and evaluated. We have similar treatment regimes in uh, elephants, but they really haven't been fully tested and evaluated like they have in humans. And the paradigm for most other species currently, like monkeys, is you don't treat, you euthanize. So I wanted to point out that elephants are very different than typical other animals we work with. Um, some questions that uh, I had as kind of summary. Uh, actually, no, never mind. I want to go to another question. <laughs> actually, yeah. let me pause here because I've, uh, do we have any other questions from the from the groups? Yeah, there's a few questions that have come up, uh, Romero. Do you recommend annual PPD testing for veterinarians that work at a zoo? I do, yes. I don't write all the policy for all zoos, but I, I personally would think it would be a reasonable thing to do. As zoo vets, um, we may or may not have an elephant in our care, and we may or may not have this issue that we're talking about today, but we certainly see primates of all kinds and various other species, and we, we're exposed to mycobacteria pretty consistently, so I think it'd be Interesting. I haven't seen any any reports summarizing whether the incidence of IGRO positive or even skin test positive is different in veterinarian versus other or zoo veterinarian versus regular veterinarians. But I think it'd be an interesting question. Okay. And a, another question is a, a compound question. Uh, what, what do you think is the impact of TB on the sustainability of captain Asian elephant populations? And do you think the wild population is at risk for having outbreaks? And is there any surveillance going on in the wild population? That is, that is a compound question. Um, I think I'll go at it backwards. Um, you know, there isn't any active surveillance in the wild. As I said, they're a hard group to sample because they are truly wild animals. Um, and you just don't walk up to a wild elephant and do a trunk wash. Um, and it's also it's very uh, uh, resource intensive to do a true surveillance of the wild population. So the best we have is proxy, which is we try to necropsy animals they find out of the wild um, and see what the incidence is in those. And then you can do better surveillance in the semi-captive population, but those haven't been done on a regular basis. Do I think that this disease is important for the conservation of the species? Well, as a veterinarian that's highly involved with the species, obviously I think it's important, but honestly, I think they have other bigger issues that impact their population more profoundly than this particular disease, if it occurs in them, in the wild or in semi-captive. And secondly, I'd, I'd like to point out that I said this wasn't a new disease in North America, and it's certainly not a new disease in Asia. And I have the suspicion that elephants both uh, or I'll say uh, a suspicion that semi-captive elephants have been exposed to this disease for thousands of years, uh, and it hasn't directly impacted their population. So bottom line is, important disease for me, important disease from a public health perspective in the United States, maybe even Asia, but not a population-modulating disease in my opinion. Okay. And then uh, another question is, are there indications for quarantine other than a positive trunk wash culture? And, uh, you know, one example would be contact with an infected herd mate or, or a positive serologic test. Yes, the first part of that question is a zoo veterinarian. I can't overemphasize quarantine for all species. 
uh, they're coming into your zoo. And you quarantine for multiple reasons. Uh, one of the major ones is exclusion of almost any infectious disease. So it makes sense to quarantine. But the second part of that question was really, other than a culture, would I use another antimortem diagnostic test as a rationale specifically to quarantine an animal? And that's a nuanced question. Um, I think I would use a serological test or history of exposure as an index of suspicion to maybe have a more rigorous or modified quarantine. But as an example, I gave of the three elephants, that one elephant with a positive uh, serological test and no other evidence of TB, at some point I would relax my quarantine if I could not prove that animal was infected uh, with antigen testing. Uh, another question that came in, are circus staff monitored with BPD testing? I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of any regulatory um, requirements. Um, certain circuses have chosen to, mo to monitor their population. Um, and certainly, it, it, it could be part of their uh, uh, health plan. Uh, but I'm not aware of mandated testing. Um, above and beyond the guidelines that suggest that everyone should be tested. But I'm not aware of a mandated or orchestrated surveillance program for that population specifically or other elephant workers. Okay. And uh, another question came in, are there any studies related to contaminated fomites or feed and handling waste from infected elephants? People have looked into that. I draw parallels back to humans and TB. I mean, historically, TB was considered, back in the turn of the century, a fomite-related disease. Uh, and it was pretty much shown not to be true. And I think the same thing by extrapolation occurs with elephants. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that, that a fomite like a rake or a fomite even like a fecal ball is, definitely, is, is, is necessarily a uh, bitus of infection. Uh, and I haven't seen much evidence to that. I, I would focus much more on identifying animals that are shedding uh, tuberculosis in their respiratory secretions than I would worrying about fomite infection. Okay. And while we're on these subjects, uh, you know, TB infection control, as you know, is near and dear to my heart. So let me take the moderator's prerogative and answer a question. Uh, as you know, the outbreaks we had with MDR-TB in the states here were often associated with environmental conditions in hospitals such as poor ventilation or us doing aerosol uh, inducing procedures in poorly ventilated areas. Uh, anything like that related? Any? Do we see outbreaks in the... Yeah, actually a lives? very good case example would be the recent uh, Tennessee outbreak uh, described by uh, Murphy um, where she talked about some elephants that were brought into the, the collection that they knew had t were exposed and knew it had TB and they maintained them in a quarantine barn. And in that quarantine barn, uh, they were using aerosol generating cleaning methods. They were using high pressure hoses. And as described, the quarantine barn did not have great ventilation. So after hosing, there would be this mist uh, of, uh, of vapor. Also, it was noted in that paper that there was an administrative area associated with that barn. In other words, where administrative workers were working that had no relationship to the elephants. But they noted that there was potential and actually showed by theoretical smoke that there could have been air exchanging and sharing of air. So what that highlights uh, is that, yeah, there could be some engineering and structural issues around barns that might lead to uh, 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 outbreak infection. And in fact, in that study, um, working with the elephant was not directly was and closely was not associated with conversion, but all of the administrators became a skin test positive. Uh, so that was an interesting interesting study and a, a definitely a good read uh, to, to get some of these details. Sounds like there's more and more similarities between the human and elephant picture than uh, than, than differences. Well, brings us back to one one health. Yep. Uh, we're sitting as a, as a physician on one side and a veterinarian on the other side, and we're basically talking about the same thing. Exactly. Um, a couple other questions came in related to diagnostics. Uh, which antigens are typically used in ELISA testing? Um, that's actually the chef's choice. Uh, but most, the most common ones are the ones that have shown to be the best 
um, our ESAT-6 and CFP-10, and then a combination of the two, a dimer of the two, is actually shown to be very good. Uh, the other ones have been shown to be less reactive and less specific to, for MTB. So again, the same as? Sim exactly the same as uh, similar. Um, and similarly, are nucleic acid amplification tests used in the diagnosis of TB and elephant? I wish they were, and I wish there were more of them. Some early efforts to use um, some of the human commercial uh, amplification methodologies did not give the greatest results when compared to the drug wash. Uh, and there was a lot of issues with contamination uh, for, uh, that confounded the PCR reaction. Or more, more recently, some people have worked on that problem and have a promising PCR test that seems to be able to read through the gunk and garbage that's in the trunk wash. I think this is the future. I think this is actually, uh, if get it if validated correctly and made practical, it may replace if not uh, supplement if not replace the trunk wash. Okay. And this question is actually not from me. Uh, would the elephant's natural compulsion to spray water over themselves be a possible transmission source? Well, that's actually a very good question because that's actually central to this uh, um, question. Is, is, are elephants like pig pen and peanuts surrounded by this cloud of, of, uh, of respiratory secretion? And you think of the elephant trumpeting, you think of them slinging water. Um, and that may be true. Um, I haven't seen much direct evidence. I haven't seen much direct research either, but I haven't seen much direct evidence that would say that elephants are uniquely uh, better spreaders because of their behavior or physiology. People say they have huge lungs, therefore they can move massive amounts of air. I haven't seen that to be proven true, but it would definitely be a good research question. Yeah, somebody should study that. Somebody. Um, do you uh, continue to collect specimens until culture conversion? Uh, in essence, yes. Uh, that's kind of the, the early logic behind the annual trunk washes. Um, it was recognized early on that this wasn't a perfect test and that theoretically you could miss an animal uh, with a yearly trunk wash. But one of the early strategies was, if, given that that's true, if you culture up every year for the rest of their lives, A, you might find them when they come out of latency, and B, you hopefully will find them. So in that sense, that's, that, that's true. Uh, serial trunk washing, I think, is actually a decent tool for identifying shedding animals in, 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 over time. I think we just had one more question come up. That's, uh, do you see a greater risk in people attending a circus to contract TB from potentially infected elephants because of the closer contact they might have in a circus than in a zoo? I'd start by saying that in current guidelines and regulatory environment, I'm not aware that any circuses have animals that they know are known positive because usually those animals are identified and treated. Um, so then, but even if we make assumptions that, okay, maybe there is an elephant in there that's positive, I think the, the amount of time that a typical circus uh, um, pers uh, patron would spend at near the elephants is very minimal. And this goes back to what's really your chances of getting TB from sitting next to somebody in a two-hour airplane flight. In a 12-hour airplane flight, maybe a little more, but a two-hour airplane flight. And the same thing with being in the audience in a circus. I just think the exposure is relatively short um, relative to the amount of time and contact we think TB needs to effectively transmit from human to human or animal to human. Okay. We'll need to wrap up shortly, but we've got a couple more questions. Um, do um, Are there source case investigations for young elephants with positive cultures as we do for infants and kids with human TB? Yes, and that case report I started out with is a perfect example. It was captive born. So it gives us an opportunity to retrospectively go back and see who that animal uh, was exposed to, and you can make the assumption that the captive-born animal did not get it from Asia. Uh, so, yeah, work is uh, in that uh, people are going down that road. Um, we haven't had that many cases that fit that description, so uh, right now we're at a case report level versus a, a real good epidemiological study. Okay. 
And this might be uh, sort of a great global question to wrap things up. Who regulates elephants in the U.S., i.e., where does a health department refer a concerned public for reassurance that they are regulating elephants coming to town? Very good question, uh, and I think that answer to that is a bit fluid. I think right now um, most elephant institutions are most consistently regulated by the USDA because uh, of um, issues of um, where you, uh, the, their animals are in display is, is a mandate of USDA animal welfare. So they're the ones that uh, uh, fostered and got the guidelines out there. They're the ones that enforce those guidelines. So from a day-to-day, -day, I would say they're the key regulatory agent. Um, as far as jurisdiction, other federal agencies would have jurisdiction. The uh, CDC might have input into this. Um, uh, local and state uh, agencies also have direct input when it involves their local area. So it, it, it's a range of people that can be involved, and that's one of the reasons we wanted this seminar is to you know, understand that it's a range of people that may be dealing with this question and that uh, you may be answering it at a local public health level, but somebody in USDA has been dealing with this for the last 10 years. Okay. Well, I would like to thank the audience for your outstanding questions. If there's any, um, ans if there's any questions that we have not answered, uh, Romero can answer those um, online afterwards. I think we've covered almost everything. And I'd like to thank Romero for a really stimulating uh, webinar, and I've certainly learned a lot. Um, and Romero, let me let you close it out. Any, any final comments on, uh, on the issue? Uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to talk to people uh, on this. Obviously, I'm very uh, involved and passionate about this subject. So um, I just want uh, as many people to have an understanding of this and as many people uh, to, to get interested and researching some of these things we don't know about this. And again, I just think it's probably the best example I can think of of the One Health. Um, we have, we're going to have more examples of these as time goes on, and this is a, a classic one. So again, thank you so much for everybody's attention. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar for today, and we thank you for your participation.